Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to this second week of webinar on applications of remote sensing for monitoring the water budget within river basins. Last week, we saw overview of remote sensing data uh, how for river basin monitoring. We went over a number of remote sensing data sets as well as a uh, land data assimilation modeling system. Today now, uh, we have a guest speaker from Johns Hopkins University, Dr. Benjamin Zaitchik. Um, he will be presenting his work on applications of remote sensing for river basin manage, uh, water management, and he's going to focus on Nile Basin. Uh, Dr. Zaitchik uh, is from uh, the uh, Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences in Johns Hopkins University, and his focus is on variability of climate and hydrology. Uh, he focuses on understanding processes, um, hydrological processes, which vary with time because of uh, climate variability, and he also um, wants to focus on coping with this variability. So he also does forecasting of uh, climate and hydrological uh, processes and forecasting for water budget management. So he is going to show how to use some of the data sets we talked about last week and how you can apply it for uh, river basin management. So with that, uh, we will have Dr. Zajic uh, give his presentation. Thank you. Good day, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the second week of this Applications of Remote Sensing to the Water Budget within River Basins, uh, presented by the NASA RSET program. I'm Ben Zajic. I'm an associate professor at Johns Hopkins University, Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences. And today I'll be talking a little bit about how my group has worked to apply remote sensing in studies of water budget monitoring in the Nile River Basin. And so I'm gonna start off uh, by just providing some of the objectives for today. There are a lot of different ways that we can use Earth observations in this river basin. I'm gonna focus on three areas of application. First, our efforts to estimate the distributed water balance across the basin. Second, how we can use Earth observation to improve and also to evaluate hydrologic models that are applied in water resource analysis. And finally, um, I'll give an example of how we can use advanced satellite imagery to monitor and understand hydrologically complex regions. I'll be giving the example of the wetlands in South Sudan, the Sud wetlands, uh, which are a very difficult place to model uh, but some observations can help us to understand what's happening there. To begin with just a little bit of background about the Nile Basin, for those who are not familiar with it, it is of course famously the longest river in the world, located in East Africa. The Nile has two headwaters regions. The White Nile comes out of the equatorial lakes around Lake Victoria. The Blue Nile comes out of the highlands of Ethiopia and flows in and is often uh, referred to what is part of the Eastern Nile Basin. The White Nile and the Blue Nile come together at Khartoum and then flow as the main stem Nile through the cataracts of North Sudan and on north to Egypt. This animation provided by the NASA Scientific Visualization Services is showing us a few of the variables that I'll be discussing during this presentation. First thing to notice uh, is that as you probably are aware, it's very dry in the northern portion of the basin in Egypt. Almost all the rainfall that falls in the basin comes in the headwaters regions in the south and the east. We're seeing here data from the Tropical Rainfall Measurement Mission showing the seasonality as you go through the year of rainfall. In the Equatorial Lakes region, there are two rainfall seasons, while in the Eastern Nile, including the Blue Nile headwaters, there's one rainfall season in boreal summer. We're now seeing ALEXI, the Atmosphere Land Exchange Inverse Model, which is an example of an evapotranspiration product derived from satellite. And finally, a land data assimilation system that's showing us soil moisture variability estimated using satellites and models. This can then be compared to the Gravity Recovery and Climate Exchange, GRACE experiment, showing a seasonality of total water storage, everything from the top of the vegetation canopy down through groundwater. 
Now, all of those tools can be used independently to look at various aspects of the water balance of the Nile, and they become very powerful when they're combined, either in a multi-sensor type of analysis, which I'll show in the first example, and also when integrated via models, um, either to parameterize those models or through data assimilation. So when approaching the Nile Basin or really any large transboundary river, I think many of us are aware you face a number of challenges. First, data tend to be sparse. So there are large parts of the Nile Basin where there just isn't monitoring available. Secondly, in the transboundary river basin, you're often dealing with a situation where some of these data, the in situ data, are politically sensitive. And so there's not a lot of sharing of information and experience across boundaries. Another point that is certainly true for the Nile and uh, of any basin in which there is um, our large uh, semi-arid or arid regions or a large amount of human water use uh, is that this is an evaporation dominated basin. Now what I mean by that is that upwards of 85% of the rain that falls in the Nile basin evaporates and leaves via that flux rather than leaving through a river. Now that's a challenge for us because evapotranspiration is a, such a distributed flux. It's all across the landscape. It's a complex landscape and evapotranspiration responds to different limitations in different places based on climate and land use. So it's, it's traditionally a very difficult flux to monitor. Uh, and finally, as I noted already, there's considerable meteorological complexity in this basin. We have these different rainy seasons dealing with tropical convection that can be very difficult to predict and even to monitor. Uh, and also hydrological complexity. Um, and that's true across the basement, particularly if we think about the White Nile coming through these highly evaporative equatorial lakes and on into South Sudan. And what I've, this dotted line roughly shows where that Sud wetlands is uh, that I'll be talking about later, uh, which is a very difficult place to model. So, The way I'll approach the three objectives is through these three studies. First, I'll be looking at remotely sensed water balance analysis. Next, I will talk about the Nile land data assimilation system, which is an implementation of an LVAS, which was discussed in week one um, in the context of the global land data assimilation system. We customized one for the region. I'll talk a little bit about that. And then finally, this wetland mapping and monitoring project. So starting with the remotely sensed water balance analysis. I'll be using here what hydrologists refer to as a first order terrestrial water balance approach, which simply means that we're going to take precipitation falling in our area of interest, subtract off evapotranspiration, subtract off discharge from the basin, which can be surface or subsurface, though I will focus on surface in this context, and assume that through mass balance, that equation will be equal to the change in storage. And we're going to be applying Earth observation to do this. So for precipitation, um, we'll be really relying, uh, as you might expect, on the precipitation measurement missions from NASA and its partner space agencies. The results I will show are from a few years ago. So we used the Tropical Rainfall Measuring Mission, TRIM. Uh, but today you can use the Global Precipitation Measurement Mission, GPM, for even better analysis. From this, we'll then subtract evapotranspiration. And as you learned last week, um, there are several different ways to do this from space. I'll be giving an example today, keeping to one to keep things simple, of our use of ALEXI, the Atmosphere Land Exchange Inverse Model, um, which we get from Martha Anderson and her colleagues at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. It's simply an inverse model that uses land surface temperature from satellite uh, and ancillary information in order to get an estimate of what the evaporative demand and actual evaporation are from the land surface. And we use this in East Africa um, using a combination. You can do this using station, geostationary satellites or using MODIS data. Um, and as was discussed last week, there is a way to access that MODIS-based product uh, via the NASA Severe portal. Uh, and here I'm just showing one example, you know, a snapshot of uh, an evapotranspiration shown here in, in units of megajoules per meter square per day, so really a latent heat flux um, in the Nile Basin. And then what we refer to as the evaporative fraction, the evaporation divided by the potential evapotranspiration to let us know something about where um, water stress is existing or where water limitation is present. And as you might expect, it's very dry in the north of the basin, wet, more evapotranspiration in the south. Now, river discharge. 
There are ways to estimate river discharge from space. Um, the altimetry of some large rivers and certainly of lakes and reservoirs However, I have a question mark here because I'm going to treat that as an unknown in this analysis, uh, simply because at the time we did the study, we didn't really have a reliable space-based estimate of discharge. We had some in-situ gauge data that we could use to, to evaluate, but our, our objective here is to do what we can with publicly available Earth observation. Fortunately, our fourth term, our storage, we do have some information on. And we take this from the Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment, GRACE, which is shown here. Um, the original GRACE mission ended a couple of years ago, but GRACE follow-on is now up and we'll be delivering data in the coming months. GRACE consists of two satellites, one following the other in low Earth orbit. And the way that this system works is that the two systems measure the distance between them using microwave ranging. And by taking advantage of the fact that the distance between them will change due to gravitational anomaly as the lead sensor speeds up over a positive gravitational anomaly and then the second sensor catches up as they pass over that, that region of the Earth, we can then estimate gravitational anomalies and changes in gravitational anomaly on Earth's surface. And it turns out that the change in gravity over time at a location relates very closely over land to changes in water storage. So it's a complicated approach, but in the end, it gives some very elegant data on that change in total storage, everything from snow, if you're in a region with snow, um, through vegetation, soil moisture, surface uh, water, and groundwater. And so that'll be our total storage change taken from GRACE. I will note that GRACE has very coarse spatial resolution on the order of hundreds of thousands of square kilometers per measurement. So you can't use it to figure out what's happening very locally but you can use it as a constraint on a basin scale water balance. So I'm now gonna show this basin scale water balance um, and I'm gonna focus on uh, three sub basins and the SUD. So uh, first to point out um, some applications relevant developments of interest in this basin. So what I've got here outlined in red is what we might call the main stem or lower Nile basin um, encompassing everything in Egypt and also North Sudan and noting here the location of the Aswan High Dam, which of course is of interest um, from a water management perspective. A lot of interest in knowing how much water is flowing into that dam. Next, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. This is a massive hydropower project currently in the final stages of construction right here in the Blue Nile uh, near the Sudanese border. Uh, when complete, it will be the largest hydropower project in the history of Africa. It will have a large reservoir behind it, and it will begin to regulate flow of the Blue Nile in a way that has not been seen before in history. A lot of interest in understanding exactly how that influences the water balance. The Sud, um, which I've talked about a couple times, located here in South Sudan, is interesting as a wetland because it is so highly evaporative. It's, it's, it's self-regulating in that it expands seasonally and during wet years, and when it gets bigger, it evaporates more. And what we find is on average, um, the flow of the White Nile coming into the south, to the sud from the south, is about twice the volume of the flow coming out in the north. So you lose a lot of water and evapotranspiration that we'd like to understand. So here's a data figure, okay? So what I'm showing here are some of the results of our analysis. You're seeing on top the Blue Nile, on the bottom the Equatorial Lakes region, so the two headwaters regions. And just showing as an example, four years. The blue line here is the trim rainfall estimate in billion cubic meters okay, per month. What we see here for the Blue Nile is this once per year seasonality as the rainy season comes in, primarily June through September. And then in the Equatorial Lakes region, we see these two rainy seasons in March through May and again in October through December in each year. And quite a bit of interannual variability. Next variable here is the Alexia evapotranspiration, which shows a similar seasonality in the Blue Nile. It lags a little bit, as we'd expect, behind the rainfall, and is smoother over the year because of water storage buffering. And in the Equatorial Lakes region, we see a significant evapotranspiration throughout the year. Um, we can then subtract off precipitation minus evapotranspiration, which I'm showing here in this dashed line, which is really just trim minus Alexi in any lake evaporation. 
And then we can compare that to the GRACE change in storage, the change in storage month to month by GRACE, which we think should have just about match precipitation minus evapotranspiration. Again, discharge being a small variable here because it's an evaporation-dominated basin. And yeah, we, we see that more or less, we get the seasonality and we get the magnitude with some differences which are of interest, but to first order, they, they align reasonably well. We can then use this information by averaging across our areas of interest, in this case, the various sub-basins and the soot wetlands, to get quantitative estimates of the water balance. So I won't uh, spend a lot of time walking through every number here in detail. The slides are available to you if you're particularly interested in this region. We have here the rainfall, the Alexi-derived land evapotranspiration, change in water storage, a lake evaporation estimate, which we do with a simple uh, energy balance analysis, and then this residual, which should be equal to the discharge because we have accounted for storage as well as eva rainfall, evapotranspiration, and lake evaporation. And what we see here, in, again, all, all data in billion cubic meters per year, is that for the equatorial lakes, it's a very wet area with a lot of evapotranspiration, and we end up with this residual of 55 billion cubic meters per year, which is what we think the flow should be coming out of the equatorial lakes region. Blue Nile, around the same order. In the lower Nile, we see this deficit, as we would expect, uh, on account of the large irrigation uh, and lake evaporation going on in the lower Nile, where there's very little rainfall. Similarly, the soot wetlands, which we know lose a lot of water, that's our estimate for the impact that the soot has on flow. And for the entire Nile Basin, we have this estimate, about 13.5, that we think makes it to the Mediterranean. I'll just simply note a couple of things. First of all, we have error estimates here, which are very important, based on the reported error metrics of these products. Is that a perfect estimate of uncertainty? Certainly not. This is a data sparse region, and there are a lot of sources of uncertainty but it gives us at least a picture of how well we think these observations might be performing. Then when it comes to the actual numbers, um, the Blue Nile, we come up with this number, um, that is just about the same as what gauge discharge is at the outflow of the Blue Nile as to what most textbook estimates are for the Nile on that order of 50 billion cubic meters per year. Similarly, um, we know that Egypt, um, at least according to treaties, gets access to about 55 billion cubic meters for their use per year, and we're on the same order there, So, we, which is about consistent with what people understand is happening with water management in that part of the basin. Similarly, the SUD matches up pretty well. Our equatorial lakes estimate we think is too high based on other estimates, and we're still working on that. That probably has to do with this large lake evaporation that is difficult to constrain. And it just so happens that our number for the entire Nile Basin matches almost exactly to 13 billion cubic meters per year that various publications by the World Bank and the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations have for the Nile. Now, there's substantial uncertainty on this, and so the fact that we hit it so closely should not be overstated. Um, we don't want to overstate the certainty of this estimate, but it gives us a sense that we're closing the water balance from space in a way that is at least realistic with respect to what uh, is understood on the ground. Okay, moving on to the next study, um, which is the Nile Land Data Assimilation System. First of all, I'd like to talk a little bit about what a land data assimilation system is. And again, this was described uh, last week um, in terms of just general characteristics and use and the way that you can get data online um, from NASA's Global Land Data Assimilation System. But in principle, what this is, is it's a tool that is merging models and observation, which is really important when you've got powerful but imperfect tools based on both process-based understanding as embodied by our modern uh, hydrologic models and the observations from space. The principle here is that if you integrate the two, you end up with more reliable and meaningful information than either one can give you on its own. In cartoon form, what this looks like is that you start off with some landscape information um, from your uh, very often satellite-derived land cover and vegetation products or, and your satellite-derived topography um, from sources such as hydro sheds. You combine that with your satellite data for, on meteorology, including, for example, your GPM precipitation. You bring these together into a land surface model, and that would typically give you some output in terms of hydrological fluxes and storages, you know, evapotranspiration, soil moisture, uh, changes in groundwater storage, river flow. 
What distinguishes a land data simulation system is the fact that as this model runs forward, it can integrate update observations, um, in this case, just giving an example of, a, of a, a footprint of a soil moisture observation from SMAP, um, and this will allow the model to correct as it runs forward by taking advantage of the Earth observation. So the land surface model is predicting soil moisture based on its inputs and its physics, and then it gets corrected as it moves along whenever an update observation is available so as to ensure that the final output is as close to reality as possible. So the land surface model, let's talk a little bit about what that is. And here's, uh, again, a schematic of a land surface model. There are a number of them out here. This one is the NOAA multi-process land surface model, but it, it doesn't matter too much. I just chose that as an example. The main point I want to make is that a land surface model solves simultaneously for the water balance and the energy balance near Earth's surface. This is very powerful because it allows for multiple constraints on your estimates and multiple sources of information going into that estimate of your water balance. And so here we see that the model will account for snow in separate layers, soil, a shallow unconfined aquifer, vegetation fluxes, um, and a little bit of information on runoff and surface water. Um, all of this will give us our estimates of evaporation, of flow, of recharge. It is taking advantage of this meteorological data, which we do not simulate, but rather taken from other Earth observation. So another point about these land surface models, I should note, it's one dimensional. So you end up with a gridded representation of the landscape, but each grid cell is one dimensional and simply solves for the local balance. And that's important when thinking about what these models can and can't do uh, in terms of thinking about lateral flow. You can have a river that flows laterally that is informed by the land surface model, um, but if you have a situation where you think that there's actual subsurface soil transfer um, that is influencing your hydrology, well, there's a limitation um, depending on your scale of analysis. Okay. Um, again, you get these update ob observations along the way, which keep the model running smoothly. We do that through data assimilation. Okay, so that's why we call these land data assimilation systems, because the algorithm used to bring those observations in is called data assimilation. I won't get into the details of the statistical methods used to do that, uh, but there are a number of ways to that attempt to balance the relative uncertainties of the model and the observation. And so LDAS are everywhere. Um, again, last week there was described this global land data assimilation system. There's also a very important uh, system here that we use in the United States called the North American Land Data Assimilation System, which provides really important information operationally in the United States. It's used for drought monitoring uh, in a way that is used to inform the payout of uh, crop insurance across the country. It's also used to initialize weather forecasts, um, and it's used for our long-term climate records. There's a similar system in South America, another one that my group is involved in developing for South Asia and an important one in uh, Africa, the Famine Early Warning System, LDAS, um, and data for uh, that system are available via NASA's portals um, for more detailed information on Africa. Our Nile land data simulation system um, was quite similar to that. It, we developed it first, um, but a lot of the information that we generate in the Nile land data simulation system has since been incorporated into FLDAS, so that would be perhaps the place to go um, if you wanted data most similar to what I'm showing here. For those of you who are interested in actually working with LDAS yourself, you can get data from those portals, but you can also get the software yourself. This is open source software supported by NASA uh, via the land information system list. This is a software framework that's used to run the land data simulation systems. You can access it through the website, the NASA land information system website, uh, and install it on your own system. Uh, and there's a community uh, that works together um, through exchange of information uh, to make sure that everyone gets the support they need um, when working with the system. So when we took LDAS to the Nile, we had a few challenges. We had to figure out which meteorological products we were going to use to run our system. We need to figure out a way to account for irrigation practices locally. We developed some code that is now integrated to that uh, publicly available list system that account for flood irrigation. Um, we also needed to gather as much information as we could on land cover and soils. Uh, there are some standard global products 
uh, but we wanted to make sure we had the best available for East Africa. And then we had to figure out how to evaluate it. Now, I don't have time to go through that entire process uh, of, in each point, um, though there are, there are certainly uh, experiences that are available through papers and through the LBAS websites at NASA on how to do that. Um, but I will talk a little bit about evaluation. If I'm in an evaporation-dominated basin that is data sparse, and I run this model or set of models in my LDAS, how do I know if I'm doing well? And so one way we did this was by leveraging Earth observation. Now, Alexi, which I described earlier and that we used in our water balance analysis, is not an input to the LDAS. The LDAS is what we call a prognostic system that is forward simulating my water balance on the basis of first principles and input parameters. Alexi is a diagnostic approach, which uses the land surface temperature from remote sensing to estimate the evaporative flux. So they're independent. And so what we can then do is look at them, compare them side by side to figure out where is the LDAS matching Alexi and where isn't it. Both products have uncertainty. Neither one is, is the truth necessarily, but both have a lot of information and agreement between the two can be viewed as a source of confidence that the system is capturing something properly. And so I'm going to talk about three points here very briefly. Um, the Nile Delta, heavily irrigated area, the Sud, um, and also in between the two, an irrigation scheme called the Jazeera scheme in Sudan. So the Nile Delta, I'm showing here is another data results slide. And again, showing the same, you know, about five years of data that I showed before for the water balance analysis. The blue line is Alexi, the red line is LDAS. The green line here for comparison is a MODIS product, the one that was uh, reported on last week. Um, and finally, we're showing here what happens if you run LDAS but don't account for irrigation. So we can actually separate what's natural evapotranspiration versus what we think is coming off of irrigated fields. In the Nile Delta, there's very little natural evapotranspiration. It's almost all irrigation. What we see is that Alexi and the LDAS, with no calibration across each other at all, match reasonably well and gives us some confidence that the LDAS is getting things right. We also note some interesting discrepancies that apparently LDAS dries out too quickly in between cropping seasons, is not uh, accounting for residual moisture perhaps, that we can then incorporate into further model development. We note that MODIS, the standard MODIS product in this region seems to be systematically underestimating. Now that's again not a judgment on against any product in particular everywhere, it just happens that that's what we found in this region. The Jazeera scheme, so that's that other irrigation system I mentioned in Sudan, and this was interesting for us because, again, the colors are the same, um, and we see that we match sometimes reasonably well between LDAS and Alexi, um, but at times the LDAS completely misses some evapotranspiration, and this was really helpful to us because it showed us that there was a small second cropping season that Alexi ob observed where irrigation water was applied that the LDAS missed because of the way that we parameterized our irrigation routine. And since this time, we've been able to improve in order to capture that second irrigation system. So again, the power of multiple sources of earth observation. Finally, the soot. And now here we see Alexi, it's noisy, but you have Alexi showing evapotranspiration year round in this wetland. The LDAS, meanwhile, totally misses it. It goes completely dry outside of the rainy season. And why is that? Well, that's because these land surface models in the LDAS are one dimensional. And they're not accounting for the fact that the, LDAS, that the soot is getting a lot of inflow from the side that contributes to soil moisture and to surface water and evapotranspiration there. And so this showed us something very valuable, which is that we need to apply a different modeling system to get this. And since that time, we have, and now we're working with a combination of models to try to improve this. But the point here is simply that if you use something like GLDAS or even your own LDAS system, or really any of these advanced land surface models in a transboundary basin where there are big wetlands, where lateral flow contributes a lot to the water balance, you need to exercise caution uh, because the models systematically do not include that process. And speaking of the SUD, that'll come to the last uh, point that I wanted to touch on today, um, which is some of our work on wetland mapping and monitoring in the SUD basin. So here's a satellite image of the SUD. It's located right here at the heart of the Nile Basin in South Sudan, taking inflow from the south. As the White Nile enters the SUD, it spreads out into two main branches, 
that then come together again at the north and the river flows on its way. The Sud, if you're wondering what it actually looks like there, it's a, a wetland. There's a lot of population that lives in the Sud. Um, and it's a wetland that uh, is papyrus dominated, but is diverse, of course, over its large area. Very important biodiversity center, particularly for migrating birds. Now, something interesting that motivated part of our work here, again, from the water resources perspective, is that for decades there has been discussion of the potential to build a canal called the Zhongli Canal, uh, named after the location at which it starts, um, that would bypass the Sud. So why would you do this? You do this because the Sud is losing so much water. As I noted earlier, the inflow of the White Nile to the Sud is twice the value of its outflow. A lot of water is lost, something on the order of 15 billion cubic meters or more. Our estimate from the first portion of this presentation was more on the order of 20-something of, of um, billion cubic meters being lost in the Sud. If you bypass with a canal, then presumably you can reduce that evaporation and get more water downstream, which of course is of a lot of interest to Sudan and to Egypt. Now, the Zhongli Canal is not a fiction. It's not some kind of grand scheme that's never actually going to come to pass. Uh, in fact, there was a lot of work to do the Zhongli Canal. This is a, a German-built excavator that still is sitting there in South Sudan uh, after it had been working to nearly complete the Zhongli Canal uh, at a time in the early 80s uh, before violence in the region basically ended that project. The Zhongli Canal was almost complete at the time that the, that the Civil War um, forced construction to stop. So this is not just something that's on a drawing board. This is something that has been almost completed, um, was then halted for decades, but is still always there in the background. Discussions every once in a while emerge. And those discussions are viewed as an opportunity, perhaps by those who want to see more water going downstream, and also viewed uh, with some trepidation, uh, both by people who, are, who rely on the sort of for their livelihoods, um, and also by those interested in biodiversity conservation and to some extent carbon conservation in this wetland. And so the question of what the Zhongli will, would do to the area of the Sud is really of some critical importance. And estimates have been made um, that are pretty easy water balance estimates to confirm that if you want to deliver four or five billion cubic meters downstream, you know, the advantage being that the, you'd have virtually no evaporation compared to what would happen in the Sud. Um, if you want to enhance that flow by five billion cubic meters, which is substantial for a river where you're talking about maybe a 15 billion cubic meter average flow coming out of the Sud today, then you would need to draw 20 million cubic meters per day. So there are some good design specifications if we want to understand what the Zhongli Canal would do. So our interest in approaching this was to say, okay, first of all, never mind the Zhongli Canal. Can we understand, can we monitor and understand the water balance of the Sud, this massive, data sparse, seasonally varying wetlands? Then can we use that information to inform our estimates of what would happen to the area of this wetlands if the Zhongli were constructed, which again is of critical importance uh, for certainly livelihoods uh, as well as for biodiversity. So to approach this, we made use of synthetic aperture radar data. Everything I'm going to sh be showing comes from the ASAR sensor, uh, but there are various platforms available um, these days that can do the same thing. So synthetic aperture radar um, is an active remote sensing technology, right, where you're basically shooting a radar signal down and measuring the backscatter. This is just an example of what the SUD looks like during a dry period or a wet period. Now, when I'm using synthetic aperture radar here, brightness is indicating the intensity of the radar backscatter back to my sensor. And in this case, on this map, just to let you know, the red and green areas are locations where we actually know what the land cover is. Okay? The green area uh, being a place that is consistently flooded, um, the red area being a slight highlands. I mean, it's a very flat area, but it's just up a few meters, and therefore it stays dry. And what we're seeing here is that things get brighter when it's wet. And also, even in the dry season, there's a big area in the middle of the soot that is giving us a bright signal, a very high backscatter. So why is this? Why do we end up with this bright backscatter in the middle of a wetland? And it has to do with the way that the radar signal bounces. So typically, what we think of is um, starting at the bottom here with dark, 
Open water looks dark to synthetic aperture radar whenever you're off nadir, whenever your radar signal is not shooting straight down. And why is that? It's because you get specular reflection off open water. It's like a mirror, and the signal just bounces off the water and, and is directed away from the sensor. Right? If you shoot it down at an angle, it bounces away. So it looks really dark because you don't get much signal back. Dry land gives you kind of a medium signal, shown here by these arrows coming off this vegetation here, because you get a kind of a single bounce, right, where it bounces off the land and either it just kind of scatters in a uh, in a in a uh, in a rough fashion, such that it scatters in all directions and you get some signal back, or maybe it also bounces off some vegetation, and so you end up with a little bit of backscatter off the vegetation as well. But in general, because you get the smooth scattering off of the rough land surface, you end up with kind of somewhat, um, let's call it a medium return. It's brighter than water, which is scattering away only, um, but it isn't that bright because it's scattering in all directions. Now, off flooded vegetation, you end up with this very bright signal because what you get is specular reflectance that then bounces off the vegetation and comes back. And so because you have such strong specular reflectance off the water, you have a much stronger signal to bounce back off that vegetation. And so you end up with something that ends up looking like a very strong signal. And so for that reason, we end up seeing this really bright white on this image, even in the dry season, when we look at the middle of the soot. Okay, so why do we care about this? We care because what this means is that we can apply the brightness to understand how much area is flooded how much area is open water and how much area is dry. And we can do this using backscatter thresholds. And so through some uh, details that uh, are available in, in some papers we've written on this, um, it's not too difficult. You identify the thresholds and you say, okay, based on these thresholds, if it's really dark, it's open water. If it's in the middle, it's dry land. If it's green, it's flooded vegetation. And here's just an example of, of, uh, of one image where this happened. And here's what happens over time, okay? And so what I'm showing here is a time series of flooded area over four years. The area here in green is what we estimate from our synthetic aperture radar estimates. Okay. The yellow is evapotranspiration in millimeters per month, shown on the y-axis on the right here, from Alexi. Okay. So we've got a seasonal signal in which the area of the soot is more or less matching the evapotranspiration as we'd expect because as the soot floods, more evaporates. We can then scatter these two against each other. So here I'm just showing um, a scatter of evapotranspiration against flooded area, and we end up with an R squared of 0.71. It's pretty good. There's some scatter there, but that's quite a high correlation um, over this time and area given the uncertainty of the products. So once we identify this correlation between evapotranspiration and area, it means that we have linked the wetland area to the water balance. Once we have that link, that allows us to solve for other terms. And when we solve for other terms, then we can perhaps look at how something like John Glee might affect. Okay, defining the water balance equation. So here I just did some quick math, um, but hopefully it's fairly simple. Q here is discharge. So Q in is the flow in through the river coming to, into the soot from the south. Q out is what flows out to the north. So your inflow minus your outflow is plus the precipitation P, any precipitation that falls on the soot, minus E, any evapotranspiration from the soot, will equal dS over dT, your change in storage with time. So flow plus precipitation minus evapotranspiration equals change in storage. These two terms, then we can relate to each other based on that, uh, that relationship between evapotranspiration and area that I noted on the previous slide. We do that by basically saying that the soot is really flat, okay, so that a change in area is directly proportional to a change in storage, assuming a depth of about a meter, which is how deep the wetland is. That means that we can then use this area versus evapotranspiration relationship to replace evaporation with area times some coefficients, we're just going to use a linear regression to get these coefficients. And we're going to replace change in storage with change in area times a constant uh, having to do with the depth. And then we solve. 
Okay, and so we solve for this using the data we collected from our Earth observation. And so now we say that we are relating inflow, outflow, precipitation, and area. Okay. So why do that? Well, because then if we say that the Zhongli Canal is going to draw a certain amount of flow out, we can solve for the change in area. If we solve for the change in area, then we can have... A, we can provide a pre-construction estimate of what Zhongli is going to do for the flooded area of the Sud, and therefore for all of the concerns about what that means for land use, for livelihoods, for biodiversity. And here's the result that we came up with. When you apply the equations on the previous slide to a Zhongli type design, here's what happens in the mean flooded area of the Sud, going from 30,000 square kilometers with no Zhongli canal all the way down to something like 18,000 if you divert up to 35% of the water. So depending on the design of Zhongli, this is what we would end up seeing. Again, there are uncertainty bars provided here. There's probably even larger uncertainty that exists from beyond the Earth observations having to do with the design of such a canal. Nevertheless, what this allows us to do is bring to the table a quantitative Earth observation observ uh, observed, an objective estimate of what different kinds of diversions would do to this wetland area. And that provides water managers and negotiators um, with some data to look at together when deciding on a course of action for this proposed diversion. So that brings me to an end of what I want to present today. Looked as we did at both the remotely sensed water balance analysis using the satellite data and then also integrating those satellite data to a land data assimilation system. And finally, at least one case study in wetland mapping and monitoring where we looked at an area where we have a lot of challenges in doing hydrologic estimates uh, that can try to address those challenges using remote sensing. So to close out, I'd just like to summarize by saying that uh, our work experience in the Nile and in other regions um, we believe does support the case that you can re use remote sensing uh, to advance your understanding of transboundary rivers, to improve monitoring over what's available um, with in-situ data, and also to predict the water balance of large poorly instrumented basins when we bring the LBAS in. I think that we've also really recognized the power in merging data streams. And now that's true when you're using multi-sensor approaches to close the water balance, and also when you're using them in data assimilation. And that can be true in kind of a confirmatory sense, saying, okay, we're, we know that we're doing well, um, but also importantly in identifying where our limitations are when we see discrepancies between different observing systems. I can't emphasize enough that the uncertainties are large and that we can't understate those uncertainties. And so whenever bringing some of these techniques into the water management discussion, uh, it's really critical uh, to acknowledge and really emphasize the range of uncertainties. Now, it's not just remote sensing that has uncertainties. Of course, any kind of estimate has uncertainties for different reasons, um, but we certainly want to make sure that we're looking at the range of estimates and not just that central estimate, like the mean prediction. And finally, I'd simply say that for all the uh, reasons why we might have um, healthy skepticism and sometimes unhealthy skepticism of these products, um, depending on people's exposure and, uh, and, and comfort level working with them, you can really do a lot through collaborative analysis. And we've been able to work um, you know, in partnership um, with transboundary water organizations like the Nile Basin Initiative. We've been able to uh, have discussions with our colleagues who do um, river management uh, in Ethiopia, in Egypt, um, and look at these data together uh, and really try to figure out how we can improve the, uh, the observations, how we can improve the models, how we can work on communication to make sure that the uh, results are neither misinterpreted uh, nor overstated, uh, and how we can think about designing future analyses to do, ana to do an analysis that's going to inform water management. Uh, and so really, when it comes down to how to use these in a river basin context, and particularly a transboundary river basin context, there's a lot of work, interesting work to be done on the observation and modeling side, on the analysis side, uh, but it's so much more powerful when it's paired from the start um, with a conversation about goals and objectives and concerns um, from the perspective of water management. 
So with that, I will stop. Thank you for uh, tuning in, and we'll have some time for question and answers. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dr. Saichek. I really appreciate uh, your presentation. I think it was very informative, uh, showing uh, applications of all the remote sensing data as well as um, ELDA system. Uh, so this is just a reminder. And you can see my screen, hopefully. Uh, today we had Dr. Saichik talk about Nile Basin water uh, balance. And next week we'll have another guest speaker, Dr. John Bolton from NASA. He will be talking about uh, both water resources management as well as flood monitoring and management in the Mekong Basin in South Asia. So that is on 27th of March. So we'll um, thank you for attending today's session, and we hope to see you next week just at the same time. Uh, we have Dr. Saichek online here, and he'll be happy to answer your questions. So we will open uh, this floor for question and answer. Just one more thing before. Uh, on our set website, you will find a homework assignment posted. So please uh, finish this complete this homework assignment by 4th April. Uh, this is one of the requirements for getting your certificate of completion for this webinar. So here is the link. You can, it will be answered through Google form. So just click on the link and answer all the questions based on last webinar session as well as today's webinar session. So with that, we'll uh, have uh, Dr. Zaitchik here and he can answer some of your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Amita. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can hear you, yes. Great. Uh, we can hear you. So thank you, everyone, for, for listening to the seminar today. Um, and I have a document here with some questions that have been typed in and called in. So I will begin with those that have already been asked, and we can move from there. Um, so the first question that came in related to the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. And the question is, to what extent has this dam affected the flow of the Nile River through Egypt? Uh, and then a follow up to that was a question is uh, pointing out that the area surrounding the dam is tectonically active. So are there risks uh, of destroying this dam due to politics or a sudden earthquake in this area? So for the first question, uh, the influence of the dam on flow is yet to be known exactly uh, because they have not begun to fill the reservoir to any significant extent, um, that will happen soon. Um, now, when they begin to fill the reservoir, uh, there is currently uh, an ongoing uh, negotiation about the rate at which that filling will occur. And that is a critical question, of course, for Egypt and Sudan, uh, as well as for Ethiopia to make sure that this is done properly. Um, and that is really in the realm of political discussion right now. And we're all very optimistic uh, that an equitable agreement will be made. The reservoir will ultimately be the volume of about two times the annual flow of the Nile River. So as you can imagine, the rate at which that is filled will have an incredible impact on how much water makes it downstream. Once the reservoir is filled, then it is, you know, it's a reservoir for a hydropower facility. And so the only way you, way you make hydropower is by putting water through the turbines. Uh, and so ultimately it will be an equilibrium system where perhaps um, there's some evaporative loss of the reservoir of a, a, a few billion cubic meters per year maximum. And so that's something to be considered, um, but there won't be continual diversion. That will mostly be occurring during the filling stage. Now, when it comes to the second half of that question about the stability of the dam and, and you know, some, some uh, saber rattling that, is, that has gone on about perhaps um, attempts to, to destroy the dam, um, certainly, you know, I, I am no different from anyone else in hoping that such, such events are avoided. Um, I do not have the expertise to comment on the uh, structural stability of the dam when it comes to tectonics. Um, that is something that certainly people are looking into, um, but I, I'm afraid I can't comment any further. Uh, another question came in. Um, I believe this is with respect to the SUD. Um, and the question is in that SUD analysis, um, when we were looking at area of the soot and evapotranspiration, um, the question is, is the correlation between the area and the evapotranspiration estimates accounting for autocorrelation, uh, both spatial and temporal? Um, so, uh, yes, um, we do account for temporal autocorrelation when doing our significance tests uh, of those correlations. Um, though I'll note that the fit is useful um, 
almost regardless, right? Because we're trying to fit coefficients for an equation. Um, but the uh, in order to test its predictive skill, we do test out of sample significance at correcting for autocorrelation. Spatially, uh, I assume there is strong spatial autocorrelation, but you know what we're doing there is taking the sum of the area for both. Uh, and so uh, spatial autocorrelation doesn't really play um, in the analysis that we did. We're just viewing it as one area um, in that case. Uh, another question came in. Oh, I like this one. Um, can you reverse calculate the effect on temperature maxima based on the amount of water removed from the wetlands? So a question here, I suppose, both about the base state and in the case of a Zhongli uh, diversion, how does that reduction in latent heat flux um, influence air temperature? Um, yeah, that would be a really neat thing to try. Of course, you know, we need to think about the atmospheric conditions, winds, circulations, everything you do when doing an energy balance to figure out air temperatures. But I think that's a very interesting question about what the cooling effect of the soot is. Uh, I have not personally looked into that, but it's something that this analysis could inform. Uh, another question. Um, up to what size of river basin a grace data can be used? Um, how coarse is grace data? Excellent question. Um, and so grace data, and, and this is a, a point of caution. If you go online to the NASA websites, you can download grace data that are gridded at 0 0.5 degree resolution, so about 50 kilometer. But we all need to be careful and understand that that's not the true resolution of grace. Grace, you would typically think of having a smoothing radius of around 300 kilometers. This varies by product. So you're talking about at least 200 or 300,000 um, kilometer squared area um, for any one observation. And then there's also horizontal autocorrelation even beyond that. Uh, so typically, I would not try to use grace uh, on a river basin that's less than certainly about three by three degrees size, you know, th 300 kilometers um, on a side. Um, and even that, we would still want to carefully look uh, at that analysis and see what's happening in neighboring areas, if there's a neighboring influence. Um, but yeah, you don't want to just use grace for a point or use it for, you know, a 50 kilometer uh, watershed. You want to be looking at larger basins. Question five, what is the difference between assimilating soil moisture data into a land surface model and calibrating the land surface model with soil moisture data? Right, so those are two powerful ways to make use of remote sensing data in the modeling context. In data assimilation, you are quite simply correcting the model in, in runtime. So as the model runs forward, you adjust it. You don't change the parameters of the model, you simply uh, correct the predictions. Whereas in calibration, you typically run in an iterative mode. You run through a simulation many, many times and adjust the parameters until you get a better match between your simulation and the satellite soil moisture observation. So both are good ways to use uh, remote sensing data. In our case, we are doing data assimilation um, simply because um, we were, we've been looking at trying to adjust these runs as they go rather than to optimize uh, model parameters. Um, but uh, both approaches are, are, are quite powerful and can be applied within the frameworks that I described. Here's another question about, about GRACE and about water storage. And the question here is, instead of using GRACE to calculate a change in storage, could you use something like SMAP, the Soil Moisture Active Passive Mission Soil Moisture, to calculate the change in storage, which I assume would be SMAP at time two minus SMAP at time one. Right. And so you can use um, SMAP to calculate a change in storage. The difference with GRACE is that GRACE, because it's responding to gravity, is really integrating water storage. Uh, and so you're getting surface water, soil moisture, groundwater, snow in places where that matters, but not in our study region. And so that change is showing our total change in storage. SMAP would be very useful for looking at changes in soil moisture, particularly surface soil moisture. Um, since the uh, microwave doesn't penetrate more than a few centimeters. So you would really be looking maybe at higher frequency changes in your surface conditions as opposed to grace looking at these longer term storage changes. Question, and next question is, would the LDAS products 
be suitable for water balance analysis and small scale catchments? Possibly. Um, so, you know, the, the precipitation um, estimates that you can get um, from NASA and related satellite products range in spatial resolution from five kilometer to 25 kilometer square kilo uh, kilometer, sorry, five kilometer grid to 25 kilometer grid. Um, and you can make estimates at that scale. That's then going to drive the LVAS, which itself has parameters that can be quite high resolution, sub kilometer scale. Um, I will say that as you go to larger areas, typically we think that errors can somewhat balance each other out. And so you're very sensitive to errors in small area analysis, uh, but there's nothing structurally that, that prevents you from um, using the LDAS for fairly fine resolution, um, and it can be applied that way. I will say that the models in the LDAS, because of their assumptions about lateral moisture transport, really aren't hill slope scale models. So you wanna at least be looking at watersheds that are averaging over you know, a catchment area as opposed to trying to figure out what's happening um, on one slope. Um, but once you're up around that kilometer to, to larger scale resolution, um, the models are, are reasonable. Okay, another question. What is the minimum size of the basin for which we can use grace to estimate storage? Okay, that's, that's the same question as we had before about the grace resolution. Um, and then it says, if our basin is part of a bigger basin, could we use a proportion of grace estimates for storage? So that's an interesting question. So if you have a grace estimate for a large basin and you want to do a sub basin, can you just use a proportion of it? Um, I'd be a little bit careful, right? Because lar the large basin might not be hydrologically uniform. And so if there are some parts of that basin that are not, um, that are, that are, have more or less water storage variability, you could get an incorrect estimate if you just use a proportion. Um, but there are certainly examples of people who are clever about applying grace in combination with their other observations to try to figure out if they can disaggregate uh, the grace. You know, uh, indeed, that's, that's a motivation of data assimilation with grace is to be using ancillary information um, like on rainfall, uh, for example, to ha help us to disaggregate grace to finer scale. Okay, and slide, another question here, specific question about storage being higher than precipitation for the Blue Nile. How can that be possible? Um, all right, so, you know, the problem is I don't actually have the slides in front of me right now. I'm assuming this is referring to the time series. Um, in which we're looking at changes in storage. Um, actually, I'm not, sorry. I, I, now I'm not sure if this is the time series or the or the or the table. Uh, I will say that um, storage being higher than precipitation, uh, we're always looking at changes in storage over time, um, and so it is possible for storage to be higher than precipitation at any given time. And that precipitation is a flux and storage is um, a mass balance term. Um, but I apologize, I, I, maybe I can return to this at the end if there's time to look back at the slides. All right, next question. Will estimation of the river discharge be used from satellite to be, be used for hydrologic or hydraulic modeling? Does this river discharge be used for monitoring river discharge instead of river gauges? So this is a question about um, satellite-based um, discharge estimates. And yes, I mean, we already use altimeters, which are, you know, these active uh, radar emissions um, to look at stage of the river, right, the height of the river. And in places where that can be associated with discharge flow through a rating curve, you can have these synthetic gauge stations, right, where every time there's an overpass of a satellite, you get a flow estimate. So that's done. Um, you know, obviously, in situ data um, has certain advantages and that the satellite is not always there and that there's some uncertainty. Um, but it's, it's, it's been quite useful in some large rivers. Um, right now, the radars are resolution limited, but the future mission, the SWAT mission, the Surface Water Ocean Topography mission, which will be going up uh, hopefully quite soon in the next few years, um, will provide uh, power to do that kind of altimetry on much smaller rivers. Um, and when we can do that, then hopefully we'll see a proliferation of these synthetic gauges where we're using satellite data just as the, as the questioner suggests. Question 11, why was the difference between the Alexi and the LDAS when analyzing in parallel? In the northern part of the Nile, it's better to use GPM and the Alexi. Um, 
So there are different reasons why Alexi is different from the LDAS. Um, in, in the northern part of the Nile, so that, that's the northern part of the Nile is lower is Egypt. That's quite dry. Um, I wouldn't say that your choice of precipitation product really matters in, in the northern part. Um, really, I think using Alexi and comparing it as we did to a uh, simulation that includes irrigation was really the best thing we could think of to do. In the headwaters of the Nile, um, then you have a, do have a choice where you'd say, okay, do I want to use something like GPM and the LDAS to get an evapotranspiration estimate or use Alexi, which is, you know, an inverse method uh, getting at evapotranspiration, the energy balance. And I think this is very much an open question. Each is subject to their own uh, uncertainties and limitations. Uh, personally, I think that in hydrologically complex areas, so I gave the example in the presentation of the SUD, um, if it's a place where we know that the model probably doesn't quite have the information it needs, um, I would put more faith in Alexi as kind of closer to an observation. Um, if we're looking at something like the Nile Highlands of Ethiopia, where you've got steep topography, uh, and perhaps Alexi itself is going to have some uncertainty because of the challenges of estimating energy fluxes and topography, um, then really you have a situation where an LDAS ET estimate driven with GPM versus an Alexi estimate from the uh, satellite temperature measurements, I would just view them as two independent methods and try to constrain my uncertainty in my estimate by using both. I wouldn't be comfortable saying that one is definitely better than the other um, without in situ data. Another question, how did you estimate other water users in the basin like municipal and industrial water use? Uh, great question, we didn't. Um, uh, our assumption here is that irrigation is far and away the largest consumptive use of water in this basin. Uh, I think that that's, uh, I think that's a very reasonable assumption for this basin, um, but certainly when getting into the details, particularly in more um, urbanized uh, areas, you would want to account for such users. Another question, what is the latency of GPM, Alexi, and GRACE data? Um, so latency is a big issue here if you want to do this in real time. Um, GPM is fast, right? You get that within hours, at least some of the products. Um, so you can get precipitation for real time. Um, Alexi has some latency. I, I, I apologize, I don't know the exact latency of the, the various Alexi products, but I think we're talking at least uh, a couple of weeks. And Grace is right now quite slow. They're just starting to work on some real-time products, um, but the standard Grace products often run a couple of months behind. And so really they're much more useful for retrospective analysis uh, than for real-time monitoring right now. Um, as I said, this is an area of active research. We're involved in some projects that are trying to uh, use real-time GRACE products um, in a data assimilation context, and hopefully um, that kind of work will reduce the latency. Um, the GRACE follow-on mission, the one that's up there now, does have specifications that are, uh, include a goal of reducing latency times um, to less than a month. Another question here, uh, you had mentioned that these are estimates. So how comprehensive should ground truthing be to make a viable decision from the regulator's point of view? This is the, this is the big question and I don't think there's a single answer. Um, I, I would say that there are advantages and disadvantages um, to using things like models and remote sensing as opposed to in situ data. On the one hand, in situ is always going to feel very concrete. On the other hand, it's not always representative. Um, uh, you know, river gauge, river uh, uh, gauges are, are good integrators, but rainfall gauges don't always capture the whole diversity of the landscape. Evapotranspiration is very difficult to measure in situ over large scales. And so in some ways, um, I think that the, the question applies no matter what your data source is, you know, how much information do you need? Um, and that's why this is a conversation. Uh, I, I think that there has to be discussion with the um, decision makers about what they feel they have the confidence to act on. There are certainly examples um, from the United States, uh, perhaps from elsewhere as well, of places where regulatory decisions are made based on these kinds of satellite observations. I also think that in our experience in transboundary basins, uh, they've been helpful in encouraging um, various parties to look at the resource 
problem through the same lens, even accounting for the uncertainty. Um, and so there's, there's, I think, good value in them already. Um, the other part of this question, of course, is how much effort we should put into ground truthing. And as a hydrologist, I would always say as much as possible, <laughs> because clearly more data um, will help us uh, and more data that is shared openly uh, would be invaluable. Okay. Does climate change feature as an input? Is important for those of us to do compliance monitoring of water resources over time? So the results that I show today um, include climate change in so much as climate change has occurred in the past several decades. Um, we are not presenting here projections. That's a different question. Uh, so the first part, the monitoring, certainly there's changes um, that we see in the record and we believe we're accounting for them. The future projections, one can use tools like the land surface models we use um, coupled with downscale uh, global climate models to understand future changes in water resources. That's a large area of research. We do some, many other groups do as well. Uh, so in that context, you're not really directly using the satellite data other than to evaluate the realism of the model um, because we don't have satellite observations in the future. Uh, but you then take what you've learned from your retrospective analysis and uh, apply it to a simulation of future conditions. Uh, what effects of the reduction in the Suds wetland to flora, fauna, and groundwater recharge from the wetlands? Um, uh, will they be assessed? Um, I, I would certainly hope that if the Zhongli Canal is uh, brought back, if that plan comes back onto the table, that there would be a thorough um, and a neutral objective evaluation of such environmental impacts. Right now, there, no one is building the Zhongli, right? That was a past plan, it was abandoned, and it's discussed now, but not actually actively going forward. Um, should those plans be activated, then I think your question is absolutely critical. Um, I think those kinds of impacts will have to be assessed. Um, I think there's an error in the example of the Jonathan Canal. The surface should be in square kilometers and not in cubic kilometers. Uh, so again, I, I apologize. I don't have the um, slides in front of me right now. Uh, perhaps if, it, if it's an area, it should be square kilometers, not cubic. So I apologize if there's a mislabeling on that slide. Uh, the volume is cubic kilometers, of course, and the uh, area is square kilometers. <laughs> uh, question, what are the basic requirements for monitoring and predicting water balance for a case study. Um, I, it's hard to answer. That's a, that's a, a good but very general question. Um, I think you need to start from your objective. Once you know what your goal is, um, you know how big is the area, what fluxes are most important, what's the resource question you're trying to address, um, then you can come back and uh, and back out the requirements. Um, and, and really, it's going to depend on context. Question 19, is it possible to estimate soil moisture flux using remote sensing? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by soil moisture flux. So the soil moisture content, yes. Um, we do that through passive microwave, as well as um, the potential to do it through active missions. Um, so SMAP is an example of that. Um, the flux is, well, soil moisture can flux either um, through latent heat flux to the atmosphere, and so that's evapotranspiration, and yes, we're monitoring that, um, or it can um, flux downward, right, through drainage, and that I'm not aware of any satellite technique to get a drainage from the soil um, into uh, deeper reservoirs. Um, that'd be something you'd want to simulate. What is the spatial scale for evaporation? Um, so if we're talking about resolution, um, uh, the Alexi products that we were using is our five kilometer resolution. Um, there are different products that range. They're on the, on the order of that, on the order of a few kilometers resolution. How do you estimate the errors in the remote sensing data? Good question. Um, and so for rainfall, um, TRIM and GPM are just, uh, and all of these products are distributed with um, error estimates. So we used the NASA provided error estimates. Um, for evapotranspiration, Alexi um, does not have as formal an estimate. They don't have a spatially distributed 
estimates the way the precipitation does. So we worked with the data producers to basically uh, estimate about what we thought the uncertainty was um, given their knowledge of past performance in these environments. But that was uh, quite admittedly a, a more informal approach to error estimates. Um, and then when it comes to water storage from GRACE, that is distributed with error estimates. And so you can get those from NASA. Um, okay, so then I think I, we have a repeat question here about, I'm gonna skip over. Um, can I know the difference between VIC model and ARC SWOT? Um, so I didn't actually use either VIC or ARC SWOT in, uh, in this analysis, um, but VIC is an advanced land surface model that's implemented in gridded format, um, typically solves for the water and energy balance simultaneously, though VIC can be run in water balance mode. Um, ARC SWAT, right, that's the ARC GIS implementation of the SWAT model. SWAT is semi-distributed, so it runs kind of on lumped watersheds. Uh, and is, as far as I understand, it's a water balance model that does not solve for the energy balance, um, which has implications, you know, depending on what kind of application you're using. Like you can't couple SWAT to the atmosphere. You can couple VIC to the atmosphere. Um, uh, but really, there, there are two advanced modeling systems, um, and I think that uh, it would if you're trying to decide between the two of them, um, you'd want to read up on, on how they've been applied in the past and you'll see advantages and disadvantages of each. Uh, and there's also a practical consideration here. Arc SWAT is um, quite correctly popular because of the way it's implemented, right? I mean, if you or your team are comfortable working in a GIS environment um, and not perhaps a command line Linux environment, um, Arc SWAT is a, is a great option. Uh, another question here about the SUD. Um, the water balance calculation of the SUD area seemed to not consider the groundwater component. Why was this left out? And if it was to be included, what source uh, of remote sensing data could have been used? Um, that's, a, that's, that's a good point. Um, so we were really looking at this in terms of the surface water fluxes, um, you know, in the, in the water storage term, since that's the largest. Um, variability on seasonal time scales. We did apply GRACE data in this study. I, I, I not, maybe I didn't show it today. And we used GRACE there to look at the total water storage um, to see if there were larger, um, you know, if, if there was a significant groundwater component that was not evident in our surface water estimates. Um, and so one could use that. One could certainly use um, a combination of methods. For example, you could use the uh, the radar data, um, SAR data to look at water extent changes, some altimetry tree to make that a volume estimate, and then GRACE to look at the total change in storage, um, subtract off your surface water estimate to get the residual to find out what's happening below the surface. And I, I believe we looked at that and found that it was not huge, but um, I should, uh, I'll be honest, that was a couple of years ago and I don't remember um, the details, um, but we found that the surface water was was the component that was most relevant to the question. Okay, I believe that that's through the questions listed here. Um, uh, Amita and, and, and team, is there anything else that we should address? No, I think this is great. Um, thank you so much for answering all these questions. Um, just one thing I wanted to mention uh, in response to one question. Next week, we will see application of SWOT in Mekong Basin. So you can see how that is um, used in, in, in some of the problems. Uh, but today it was great, Ben. Uh, thank you so very much for your presentation as well as the question answer session. Um, and uh, if we have any more questions, we'll probably just contact you. But I think this was a a uh, great example of how remote sensing data can be useful for different applications in a river basin. So if there are no more questions, we thank all the participants for attending today's session, and we hope to see you next week at the same time. Uh, please complete the homework assignment. You'll find that on our set website, and uh, we'll see you next week. So thank you, thank you everyone uh, from the RSET team also. Uh, for helping with the uh, webinar session today. And thanks again, Ben Zachek, for today's session. Thank you all.